Good afternoon, and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and our program, Where the Road Leads. I'm Doug Martin. I'm sitting in for the usual Friday monitor. That's Ted Ralston. I've had the pleasure of appearing here as Ted's guest twice previously on this show uh, with my colleagues, Dr. Ken Kaneshiro, the director of the UH Manoa Center for Conservation Research and Training, and Mr. Herb Lee, who's the executive director of the Pacific America Foundation. In both those programs, we looked at a number of innovative initiatives that are taking place right here in Hawaii, new technologies that are revolutionary and potentially game-changing throughout the world. Today, we're going to be discussing one of those technologies, one of the most exciting ones that has a tr tremendous potential for growth and that's being very actively pursued here in Hawaii. We're talking about UAVs, Unmanned Aerial Vehicles. They're also known as Unmanned Aircraft Systems, UASs. To the general public, however, they're simply known as drones. We have with us today three guests. On my left here, Jennifer Davidson of the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center, which is a federal emergency management administration, that is FEMA, supported center through H. Manoa. She appeared here a couple of weeks ago with the NDPTC team on a, on a previous program. We also have to her left, Chuck Devaney from the UH Manoa Geography Department, who's an avid UAV builder and flyer and a geospatial analyst. We have his friend here on the table that she'll be talking about. We have with us also on Skype, Mr. Nick Turner, spatial data anal of the Spatial Data anal Analysis and Visualization Labs at UH Hilo. Hi, Nick, you're there with us okay? I am. Hello, everyone. Great. So we're going to be looking at the uses of these UAV systems. Specifically, we're going to be focusing on disaster preparedness and disaster uh, um, relief. And we'll also be talking about other uses of UAVs and new emerging te technologies. Um, Chuck was recently in the Philippines providing post-disaster geospatial analysis utilizing UAVs, which offered an excellent opportunity for showcasing how the potential game-changing and life-changing uh, benefits from this innovative technology. Uh, I, as the director and the president of Development International, which is a Hawaii and California-based NGO focusing on global development, I'm very interested in the, all the various uses of UAVs in development, not only disaster preparedness, but also the other kinds of technologies, which we'll touch on a little bit here later as well, and uh, where UAVs offer a really unique opportunity to change the landscape and global development. I want to start out with asking Chuck a little bit about, to tell us about his work in the Philippines. He's recently returned. Uh, he was over there post uh, Superstorm Haiyan in Taklaba and did some very, very interesting seminal research using UAVs in that site. And I'll let Chuck talk about that a little. Okay, well, thank you, Doug. Um, yeah, so we, our first, we did a total of three trips. Our first trip, uh, we really didn't know exactly what to expect. We went in there with very entry level platforms, um, you know, totally prepared to lose them, break them, and everything. Um, the, first, the first trip consisted of about 12 days of imaging in northern, in North uh, Cebu around the Bohol, in the Bohol area, where uh, we, we covered, I guess, mo most of that, uh, the northern tip of, of Cebu. Um, we put the imagery together and started to just deliver it to uh, our colleagues with the American Red Cross and then, of course, all the local municipalities, and they instantly saw the, uh, the value in it. So that stemmed into another effort that happened about three weeks later where Nick and myself actually went and uh, we made connections with some other like-minded like individuals at a company called SkyEye um, based, out of, uh, well, it's out of, based out of the Innovation Center at University of Ateneo in Manila. So we teamed up with them and uh, they were using the same sort of platforms we were so it was really, really uh, easy to transfer equipment and, and such from one plane to another. Uh, we headed to Auckland where we spent 10 days imaging um, this river system that had been uh, uh, affected by a lot of flooding and totally changed the entire fluvial process. And that then stemmed into a 
aerial imaging consortium where we actually produced and, and uh, published a, a paper uh, that was presented at the International uh, Unmanned Aerial Vehicle uh, Convention in Florida this year. So a lot of good things have come to come from it. Um, the concept, I believe, has been proven. Um, we've developed a really uh, viable, uh, somewhat safe, well, very safe and, and, and uh, reliable um, sort of uh, expendable subclass of a tactical drone. So mm -hmm. when I say expendable, that means it's not going to hurt our pocketbook quite as bad if these things go down or get damaged in the field mm -hmm. and uh, they're easily repairable. So. Yeah, a lot of great things have come out of the uh, work in the Philippines, a lot of lessons learned, and we continue to move forward with that. Mm -hmm. Great, that's super. Uh, Nick, can you tell us a little bit about the UAV work there at uh, UH Hilo and what you've been involved with? Uh, yeah, definitely. So um, at UH Hilo, we've been uh, looking at a lot of environmental applications with UAVs, um, kind of tracking invasive species as they move in, especially in our uh, Kona uh, site. Uh, we've also been looking at uh, erosion studies, uh, both on uh, uh, Mauna Kea and also in the uh, Kohala area. And uh, also looking at um, disaster relief. Uh, so I was with Chuck in the Philippines, as he said. And uh, more recently, um, I've been trying to help out with the uh, uh, Puna relief efforts um, as much as I can. Um, and it's been a pretty tiring week uh, for pretty much everyone in Puna. Uh, lack of power and, and water and everything just kind of takes a toll on everyone. Um, but I'm in Hilo right now, so <laughs> there's power. Uh, it's good to have <clears throat> lights on and everything like that. Um, <clears throat> but I'm not sure if you guys have the photos. I sent a few photos to go with it. Um, check those out. Uh, could you expand a little bit about on some of the specific work you did with the, uh, uh, the storm that we had last week? Give us an idea of, of what actually took place, what, uh, sort of events on the ground, if you would. And, and, and how the actual application of the UVAs were useful. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the storm, everyone got pretty prepared for it. Um, and I, I think uh, Puno is probably the hardest hit area um, in Hawaii. Um, and the day after the storm, it was pretty apparent. Uh, you're just driving on the ground, you know, there's trees blocking the major roads. Um, pretty much everyone was out of power. A lot of power lines came down. and. Uh, it looked pretty bad on the ground, but once you got up in the air, so I sent up uh, my copter. It's similar to the one you see on on the table in front of you. It's a, it's actually a it's a hexacopter, but it, it's actually in the shape of a Y, so we call it a Y six. And uh, basically, that's my main uh, personal copter that you know I put together. So, kind of flying uh, with my own equipment. Um, and you know, once you get up in the air, it's just the the devastation becomes really apparent. Uh, entire forests were just mowed down. Um, all the structural damage to houses becomes uh, pretty obvious from the air. Um, and so what I've been doing is uh, just kind of flying in, in uh, certain hard hit areas and just trying to get some aerial imagery um, to kind of support things that are happening on the ground. Um, and so uh, Ted uh, Ralston actually hooked me up with uh, Team uh, Rubicon. It's a disaster relief organization um, based out of California. And they're over here uh, providing relief uh, for anyone whose home has been badly damaged. And I've been trying to uh, help them with damage assessments. Um, so just kind of giving them that bird's eye view of what's actually happening um, so they can better direct their uh, resources. Great. Thanks, Nick. Jennifer, what are the uses of UAVs in disaster management? I know that uh, NDPTC is very interested in getting, taking a lead role in, in implementing UAV technology. And could you tell us a little bit about how you see that being used in disaster management? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, right now at the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center, we're, we're preparing a, a series of courses on UAVs in, in disaster management. So there's so many applications out there, and it's, it's just, just taking off right now. It's very, very early on in, in its um, applications. So there are several things. Immediately after a disaster, UAVs can, can go up instantly. You pop them up and you get an immediate damage assessment. It's really important for um, emergency uh, vehicles coming in. They need to know which roads are blocked by, by downed trees and, and uh, power lines and things like that. You can, you can immediately do an assessment of what roads are open so the emergency vehicles can get in. So uh, also to know of evacuation routes for getting, getting people out as well. Um, 
and then also just to get a general sense of, of where the biggest pockets of damage are so you know where to concentrate um, the response efforts. A um, couple of other things, one is, is search and rescue. Um, the UAVs can uh, be mounted with infrared cameras. They can go immediately, say you have a, uh, an earthquake and a uh, damaged building and you're searching for uh, possible survivors inside. Um, an infrared camera can, uh, on a UAV can, can come in and get close and do an assessment and, and figure out exactly where people may be located, which, which is hugely important because that's, uh, you know, it's a matter of minutes of saving people's lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, UAVs can go in there and, and immediately, as opposed to individuals having to try to figure out you know, where people are, they can get an immediate answer on, um, from this. Um, also, uh, they can be used as communication networks. So if you have uh, power outages and the internet's down and all that, you can pop up a series of UAVs and they can actually be used as, uh, uh -huh. as, as a communications network. You can also um, attach small packages, say, uh, of medicine to people that are in remote areas and you can fly a U UAV in there and uh, uh, drop off you know, critical medicine or, or other, other small critical supplies. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say that they can be a communications network above a, a affected area, is this a, a, a local network or would this also be connected to, uh, say, via internet or some other uh, means to the outside world? It's, it's a, they're still working on exactly how that, that technology mm -hmm. would work and, and what it would be used for. But one, one really important application would be all of the uh, emergency uh, management people need to be able to communicate with each other. So they could be at all different parts uh, of a disaster area and need really quick communication. And communication is, is essential for um, proper emergency management. So um, that, could, that could definitely serve that purpose. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with the, you know, you, you, you pop up the drone, the uh, UAVs and, and have the imagery. The imagery can be immediately downloaded and disseminated to all the emergency managers that need it. So mm -hmm. you, you can have instant information. So that's, that's really critical. So everyone um, working on the, the disaster response can, can have the same information mm -hmm. at, at the same time. Excellent. Excellent. This question is for both Chuck and for Nick. Um, based on your experiences uh, in the Philippines and then also last week with um, Isel, uh, what kind of challenges did you encounter, specific challenges that would be UAV specific kinds of challenges to the work that you did there? Okay, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, well, Nick remembers the Aklan River and how many planes actually went down. So. Sometimes you have all kinds of RF signals. Maybe um, you have damage from, from a landing. And, and uh, for some reason, the biggest challenge that we faced was trying to image the Auckland River system. Um, we didn't really find a lot of challenges in terms of like uh, navigating through local municipalities. Everybody, the, all the hosts seem to be very, very welcoming um, to us. Very, very interested in the, uh, the, um, the technology. Um, there is now some challenges now in the Philippines where they're trying to do the same thing as the FAA is here. They're trying to regulate everything. Um, there has been an incident, incident recently where some of our team members were actually uh, abducted by the New People's Army and had their equipment stolen. Um, no problems. Let them go right away. But um, you know, in some of these areas, you need to be somewhat protected by uh, Philippine National Police, let's say in the Philippines, um, uh, armed forces, whatever. And then in some cases, you might run into some issues post-disaster uh, with logistics. For us, mm -hmm. we run everything is electrical. We need 12 volts of power to charge our stuff. So we need to find somebody that, on the ground where we can employ them and their vehicle so that we can both have uh, a, a vessel to, to move our equipment and to, oh. to charge as well. So. Mm -hmm. Well, one nice thing about UAVs, though, is they still are fairly simple. I mean, he, he just needs the to be able to charge the battery, but it's it's, it's more it, it's a it's a simpler process than than needing an aircraft, a large uh, manned airplane or or helicopter. And um, one of the things that I know Chuck um, and and Ted uh, Ralston are trying to do with the saying the expendable class is have these so 
a, a, a local municipality can own one themselves and operate it themselves to really take it down to a local level, which is important in international development as well, as opposed to having a top-down approach to disaster response, you can have a bottom-up approach, and because uh, it's really important in disasters, immediately after disaster, to get up and, and get a, a visual image of what's going on. And if these are, are deployed in, you know, every small town, then um, it's, it, it makes for a, a really rapid response, which is essential for, for disaster response. And uh, just just to add on to uh, what Chuck was saying mm -hmm. about the uh, regulations. Um, I definitely think for the uh, for the U.S. right now, um, one of the toughest challenges is actually regulations more so than the technology itself. Um, uh, it's pretty restrictive uh, in the U.S. right now with the FAA. Um, so uh, during um, these types of operations, usually if you're representing a public organization, uh, you're supposed to get what's called a uh, certificate of authorization from the FAA, and this is basically permission to fly um, if you're representing a public organization if you're if you're flying as a as a private citizen uh, with your own equipment um, then you're under what's called hobbyist rules and you're basically allowed to uh, fly as long as you stay under 400 feet and just try to uh, keep everything line of sight as much as possible and so right now I've um, you know I'm not representing any official organizations when I'm flying I'm just a private citizen uh, trying to help out the community and so just uh, keeping everything as a, under hobbyist rules right now. Thanks, Nick. This is an important area that I want to explore a little further. We're going to take a break and come back when we do. I want to talk a little bit about the situation of authority, the FAA, and specifically with UAVs here in the U.S., and how that might be different in other countries abroad. So this is Think Tech Hawaii, and we'll be back after a short break. Hello, I'm Martin Despang and I'm the host together with the one and only Ali Amashta and our show is called Urban Transcendence. And Urban Transcendence is about identifying where we have a unique situation of a vibrant city in one of the most beautiful natural environments. So how these two can coincide, sometimes conflict, how they could find reciprocity in the 21st century is what we're excited about. And we're planning on bringing in uh, a diverse body of, of guests, both from the arts and the science and the established and the wise and the emerging generation. So hope you will join us. We'll always be on on Thursdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Thank you. Good afternoon. We're back here at Think Tech Hawaii with Where the Road Leads. Our subject today is UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles. Our guests with me today Jennifer Davidson of the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center, Chuck Devaney from the UH Manoa Geography Department, and Nick Turner, who is via Skype with us, who is a, from the uh, um, Data Analysis and Visualization Lab at UH Hilo. Uh, when we took off before, we were talking before the break about regulation and authority issues. And Nick, you were making the comment about uh, being very strict to the point that where you were even having to operate now as an individual and not as a, as a public entity. Um, I'm going to ask you to expand a little bit about on the specific issues you have there. I know that you had mentioned the certificate of authority that I believe you do have there at UH Hilo, uh, but for the specific use in agriculture, if I'm not mistaken, and that you were not granted the, that authority to use with the ESEL in the, in the uh, in the wake of the disaster. Could you explain a little bit about on that and what, what that challenge represents? Sure. Um, so I guess, you know, what's happening right now is uh, the technology is at a place where uh, regulations are still trying to catch up. Um, and so one of the biggest challenges is definitely, uh, you know, defining what is permitted, what's not permitted in the eyes of uh, the FAA, um, who oversees all of the uh, airspace in the U.S. Um, and as far as UAV is concerned, um, they really want to keep it on a tight leash, so to speak. Um, for for hobbyists, you know, you can you can build your own aircraft and go out and fly um, anywhere there's open space, so long as you you know keep it in line of sight and under 400 feet. Um, but when it comes to public organizations such as uh, the state government or or even a nonprofit, um, then they're they're actually even more restrictive, and they require that you would go through a process um, to apply 
uh, to legally fly in the designated areas. And so you give them, um, it's, qu it's quite a lengthy process. It usually takes a few months, three to four months, uh, before you'll get turnaround uh, for approval. Um, but you're basically telling them where you're exactly you're going to fly, what type of aircraft you're flying, um, what the purpose is, all of these different things. And the university has uh, two active COAs um, on the Big Island right now, um, uh, both for uh, environmental um, uh, monitoring. And um, we don't have any COAs for any type of uh, emergency relief work. And so that's why um, I've been basically... Taken, took off work, uh, just volunteering my time completely to uh, fly my personal uh, hobbyist aircraft. And, and so that kind of allows me to uh, just kind of go on my own and, and do things without having to go through any um, uh, more stricter regulations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that where that's going to be a big issue uh, here uh, as we expand this technology and it becomes more prevalent and the public realizes there's more important uses for that. So the whole issue of uh, authority, regulation, and the relationship with the FAA is an important one. Uh, I know, Jennifer, that's something you've been involved with here with ND NDPTC, and you're preparing coursework on UAVs uh, that will be offered to, to various uh, public agencies and use of those. And also, you're very much interested in, in working w directly with the FAA on the issue of uh, uh, issuing COAs and the overall authority regulations that will govern their use in the future. Could you spend a little bit of, on what you've done to date and what the status of that is and, and where you see that going in the near future? Uh, yeah, so the um, with this first course that, that NDPTC is preparing, um, we are going to be, uh, our, our audience um, are mostly uh, people within, in public agencies um, nationwide and uh, generating interest and letting people know about the uses of UAVs in, in disaster work, all the, all the opportunities there are. But then also getting into explaining the regulations and exactly when and when they can't um, operate them because there, there are different rules for public entities versus private individuals, um, as, as Nick explained. And um, so we are going to be working directly with the FAA on this to, um, to, to really understand exactly what can be done in, in disaster work with UAVs. And then also to help, we, we want to really be involved in creating sort of a, a, a framework for helping UAVs expand into, um, into disaster management even more because um, th there's so much potential, as, as I mentioned, but there are also a lot of issues you have to figure out. I mean, there's disaster response right now has, you know, very set policies and procedures, and there are a lot of organizations that are working together in, in a disaster response situation. And now we want to bring UAVs into that, which can greatly help, but you also need to make sure that it offers the most benefit and that it's done the right way and that it fits into the procedures or the procedures are changed to accommodate UAVs. Like, as I mentioned earlier about getting out information, so UAVs out there flying, but it's only as good as the information getting to the right people. And then in addition, the people need to not only have the information, but to be able to do an analysis themselves. So uh, another course that we're gonna be following up on is is the actual analysis, the data analysis and the imagery analysis mm -hmm. of UAVs because then you, you need to take the data and take the imagery and use it for decision making in, uh, in disaster work. Mm -hmm. Great. Chuck, what are some of the lessons that you would say that you've picked up from your uh, practical application of using UAVs in an actual disaster situation like you had in Tacloban, which is a probably world-class disaster situation, and I would imagine if there were ever a better place for showcasing that technology, that was probably the premier event so yeah. far. Yeah, definitely. Tacloban was uh, like uh, a total playland for emergency first responders, <laughs> for sure. Everybody was there. Um, so yeah, we did. We got some great imagery of Tacloban. We not only Tacloban, but a lot of the, a lot of area in uh, in Leyte itself. So. Um, some of the lessons we've learned, um, well, we all became really, really good repairmen. Um, in a disaster <laughs> area, this scenario, a lot of times you just don't have the, the nice grass landing to, to land your aircraft in. So sometimes these things get broken, but you know, thankfully a lot of this technology is, you know, if we can, I could actually take 
this autopilot right out of this helicopter and put it into one of my planes, load the firmware, and I'd be up and fly, flying again, no problem. Mm -hmm. um, we also learned how to establish relationships within you know, the, the, the local people. So a lot of times we would be in an area where we thought would be a good spot to launch and recover, and all of a sudden somebody's coming along and chat them up a little bit and find out you're talking to the barangay captain. He says, no, man, I got a way better place for you to launch and recover your aircraft from. So then you have your, your little convoy up to a nice hill, hilltop and you launch and recover. Um, learned a lot about you know, the, you know, the capabilities, the endurance of these aircrafts, the type of, uh, the type of uh, punishment they can take. Um, what the best fit is. The mission definitely defines a platform. So, and then thinking about the entire methodology. What is what does it look like when you get there? Is it we're we talk about two guys in a truck. So, what does that look like? Um, well, for us, it means we put something like this in the air, like Jennifer was saying, get the immediate situational awareness, and then say, okay, we need to navigate to this area because it's a, it's better for us to set up and deploy our fixed wing aircraft where we're going to get the the bigger picture and then just kind of leapfrog upon, upon that. Uh -huh. And then um, we've also learned that there's a little bit of a challenge in how we disseminate the information. So mm -hmm. when we go out there, we could you know, potentially you know, gather gigabytes, terabytes of information that we you can't move because you may not have the communication infrastructure in place. So what does that look like? Do you move the information by a, a memory card or, or a uh, thumb drive? For, to give it to perhaps an airline pilot or a C-130 pilot, they can at least get it from, for example, Tacloban back to Cebu City or Lapu-Lapu, who can then give it to an airline pilot who is going to be landing in Seoul, Korea. And from there, they, we can, we're able to, or maybe even from Cebu, we're able to then pipe that information to anybody who needs it, American Red Cross, linking the world, whoever. Right, great. Nick, how about uh, post the cell? What guy? What? What's been the takeaway there? What's uh, What's been the follow up? Uh, what's been the reaction of what you you were a, you were able to do, even though was, you were doing that on your own? What do you see as being the takeaway from that experience on Big Island? Well, I think the uh, the, the takeaway message is that um, I think as far as regulations go. There's a lot of things that uh, would make things run a little smoother if we had them set up uh, ahead of time. Um, but as far as the technology itself goes, um, for, for me, it was personally, I just kind of had limited flight time with my, uh, the amount of batteries I had, that sort of thing. So getting access to uh, electrical sources, uh, Chuck kind of alluded to that earlier. Um, in Pune, since most neighborhoods were without power, that can be a, a challenge, uh, especially when you're in the field. Um, which just limits the, the amount of um, flights you can do in a day. Um, but I, I think, you know, that it's still, the relief efforts are still ongoing right now. Um, a lot of the neighborhoods have recovered uh, their power, uh, restored power. Nanavale, I believe, still does not have, Nanavale and Kapoho, um, I believe, still does not have power. Uh, but most of the major roads have been reopened, um, but there are still a few um, quite a few uh, side and inside roads that are still uh, completely blocked off, which makes it uh, difficult for uh, residents to get out of their, their neighborhood. Um, but as far as I've seen, though, the uh, coordination has been uh, really great here um, on Hawaii Island. Uh, the, the county and civil defense has been able to coordinate with uh, a lot of different organizations, and um, the response time has been uh, pretty impressive um, from my point of view. And uh, I think, you know, just having uh, you know, one of my goals with working with Team Rubicon was to see how effective uh, a UAV uh, partnered with a ground relief team uh, can be. And I think uh, in the future, I hope to see uh, almost all uh, disaster relief teams have their own uh, aircraft that they can uh, use to either scout out the area they're working in ahead of time for safety reasons and also for planning, um, but also. Uh, just to be able to uh, coordinate the relief effort with other organizations through um, through a uh, spatial interface. Um, I think that's uh, one of the key uh, benefits of, of UAVs is bringing all of this data, all these different data types together into one uh, geospatial uh, format. Great. I'm going to ask Chuck now if he would be so kind as to introduce our silent guest here. <laughs> and and uh, he'll probably have to speak for our guest that's on the table here before us. And uh, just give a little bit of oversight, uh, uh, show us 
what the basic makeup of this is. And if you would also, in doing that, explain a little bit about the difference between the rotor craft and the fixed wing, and the interchangeability of the parts, and then the different application focus of the two. Okay, well, I'll, I'll first, uh, I think it was the third question you asked is uh, the difference between this and a fixed wing. Well, a fixed wing um, has wings. It's uh, able to glide, it's able to, you know, um, navigate uh, more further and more efficiently over uh, larger areas of land. Um, also, in the event that there is uh, an equipment failure, you can generally land them safely on the ground or glide them safely to the ground. Something fails on this, it drops straight from the sky right down to the ground, and um, most of the time it's a complete and total loss. But the value of it is, is that it um, can go, you know, pretty much go straight up it can hover very, very well. It's very, very stable. We actually just went and tested it today. It's a, it's a 3D robotics product. Um, Nick has one uh, called a Y6. It's very similar, except for it's not in this hex formation. His has, it's, it's got a, a tri-arm system where the, the propellers are stacked on top of each other and work uh -huh. in, you know, kind of a, uh, in, in, in sync with each other. Um, it's an open source platform. You just basically buy the parts and then all of the mission planning, all of the firmware, software that's involved is all open source. So we can work more closely with those developers and kind of based on their needs. We ran into a lot of issues with, uh, with it when we, were dealing, when we were working in Auckland. So we were able to get in touch with the developers and they wrote us a new firmware package that kind of tailored to, to our needs. So it, it, that's really, really nice. Um, so this more or less would be a composite then. This isn't a, a product per se, but it would be composite. It is, you buy the kit components. or you can even buy them ready to fly. It depends uh -huh. on how much money you want to spend. It's probably about a three or $400 difference if you have them build it or if you just buy the parts and build, build it themselves, yourself. You, can, you don't really even need to do that. You can buy, you know, you could, these are aluminum arms. These are, this is just basic aluminum tubing. This is just fiberglass. CNC uh, cut fiberglass, um, super simple. And then there's a lot of aftermarket stuff like this. This uh, anti-vibration dome has really made a big difference. Um, taking and, and disabling the magn magnetometer on the board itself and moving it away from the board makes a huge difference. They're fussy. Copters are fussy. They really, really rely on GPS and, and, and compass. So when you lose that, it tends to lose orientation and it doesn't want to behave properly. Mm -hmm. The, the goal of these is, is to hover. They want to stay stable. Um, for what we do, we want it to go straight up, give us our situational awareness, be able to navigate it around, and then bring it down. Um, <clears throat> they're not that efficient. So you have, I have uh, six, six uh, uh, motors spinning at 10,000 uh, revolutions per minute, and each one of these speed controllers drawing 20 amps. So um, on the average, when it's hovering, it's drawing about 40 amps. So the 5,100 milliamp hour battery, you're going to get about eight minutes out of it where a 5,100 milliamp hour battery, you can get 45 minutes out of it in, in a fixed wing. So fixed wings are much, much more efficient um, and, uh, than, than these are. So um, you can put gimbals on these to you know, have like a stable video if that's what you're looking for. In, for example, uh, in cinema, um, we prefer fixed wings in most of our applications, especially in mapping, just because sometimes uh, uh, the, uh, the, the analytical software that we use a lot of times requires structure for motion, so you, the, the overlap needs to you know, be 80% or 75% overlap and side lap, and then you really, really get that when you have a forward-moving vehicle. So kind of going back uh, to what I had mentioned before, the mission defines a platform. This has a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. The fixed wing has a specific purpose but the parts are relatively... Uh, Jennifer also mentioned in, in the helicopter another advantage is going into structures as well. Sure. Which I think in disaster, right. uh, uh, post-disaster work, that would be... Uh, uh, you can, yeah, work. you can. You can go right inside if you need to. Of course, you probably want a smaller vehicle than this um, mm -hmm. just so you can kind of navigate. So most of everything that we have is fitted with, a, uh, with FPV, so first-person view, so we can actually see what the vehicle sees see. and have it piped to it whether you wear goggles or if you have a pipe to a little screen or whatever. So yeah, um, they do have smaller versions um, that you can definitely navigate indoors much mm -hmm. easier than, than something like this mm -hmm. for sure. And the thing is also with hovering, so not only be able, being able to go indoors, but also if you're trying to do a really up close damage assessment of a specific building, you can go right up to it and, and hover and get, an, get imagery to know of uh -huh. the, the um, structural damage. You can also go like underneath the bridge and, and do a damage assessment uh, of Root a bridge tops. or a, a, of a dam and go right, right <laughs> over there and, and do an assessment. So yeah, the, like Chuck was saying, they're very different applications. This is for 
up close and and really when you're using the hov the mm -hmm. hovering feature, he said it may last uh, um, this one up to eight minutes. The max that, that that I've seen is they say up to thirty minutes on 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 some vehicles, but but it's very limited. But then you're paying a lot close. of money for yeah. something like that. Yeah. Exactly. So the, you got know, to think but about the cost benefit. We can keep it cheap. We can handle. We can do this. We can have a bunch of these if we want to because we can work on them. We build them ourselves. We do all of the programming ourselves and everything. So it's it's not that. We can't deal with it, but if you have something that's going to be 40 minutes, 30 minutes in the air, you're probably shelling out 20k, yeah, it's, it's, and it's you can't fix it when it fails. Mm -hmm. Right. So. But then the mm -hmm. fixed wing ones can go long distance. So if you're trying to get a, you know, the mapping of a of a large area to get a really broad sense of of the damage, then you want fixed wing that can go back and forth and can be up for a long mm -hmm. time and get in a you know whole map of. Of a, of a town mm -hmm. or, or a city, so just different applications, um, mm -hmm. but both essential for disaster work. So, what what would be the next steps? What are what's the challenge to expanding the role of UAVs in disaster management? You've talked about the disaster disaster management being something that NDPTC is looking at, and where do you see that going? Where, where what's the future, uh, and, and what are the challenges? Whether it be the FAA or whatever, as far as uh, broadening the impact and the use of this technology uh, all, in all aspects of disaster management? I see one, one key area is that the people that work in uh, disaster management right now need to get involved with UAVs. These are being built now. They need to be working with the manufacturers of the vehicles, of the sensors, so they're being built f to help uh, disaster work. Also, I think uh, disaster uh, people in disaster management need to be more involved with the FAA to help guide. And the FAA right now is just on the frontier of, of, of their regulations on UAVs, so they want help from uh, from these industries, and you can play a very important role in in guiding the way the regulations go to really make sure that they make sense um, for your industry so really not just disaster management people but people in in agriculture conservation whatever the field may be where uavs are are going to be a game changer really those everyone involved in those industries right now really need to be thinking about about UAVs and making sure they're they're playing a role as opposed to just waiting for the technology to come to them they need to go to the technology and make sure it's it's going to work for their industry that's a key point that you just brought up Jennifer and in, in, in my work uh, with development international my organization where we're looking at global development I'm interested not in just specific applications UAVs but I'm looking at this the technology in the broadest and most comprehensive sense what can we add to the, to the broad global development pantheon of services? How, how can we integrate this technology and what we're doing to help uh, really achieve uh, community, local community empowerment throughout the world? We've talked about the uh, different uses in disaster use and also the fact that it's, it's very cost effective. What are some of the ways, I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in specifically through Development International of looking at ways of of, of promoting this technology to the clients that we have all over the all over the globe, there I can see just from what you're saying here that there are lots of ways that this would totally change local communities' initiatives towards how they uh, address their own local development areas. And so, um, let's talk a little bit about that. We have just about three minutes left. If we could focus on some of the other things, I know we've talked about agriculture. Um, Nick's mentioned about resources that uh, they're doing it through UH Hilo. Let's, if all three of you would, wouldn't mind just weighing in a little bit in some of the, the loftier ways you see in the future of, of UAV technology really becoming a game changer. I'll go ahead and start with you, Jennifer, since you were the one that brought this up. Okay, yeah, so, so besides disaster management, um, yeah, we touched on agriculture. There, there are a ton of uses in, in agriculture for monitoring the, the health of of crops and, and plants and things like that. Also, they're doing a lot of conservation work in Africa of um, monitoring poaching. So they're uh -huh. they're um, able to just fly around and, and monitor, make that sure there's the game parks. poaching, yeah, uh -huh. again, uh, to help reduce poaching of, of elephants and, and rhinos and, and things like that. So um, so those, those are a few um, huge areas. Um, 
also monitoring uh, right right now. They're they're using them after um, the Japanese uh, earthquake and and tsunami and then the nuclear melt meltdown. They're using them at um, at the uh, uh, Fukushima plant to monitor uh, radiation. Mm -hmm. So that that's another. Uh, large use. Uh, Nick, could you say a few words about what you're doing uh, there on the Big Island as far as the environmental? Uh, <clears throat> sure. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of our projects uh, have to do with remote sensing. So as Chuck was kind of alluding to, uh, basically mapping out an area and kind of identifying um, through image analysis, whether it's you're trying to tr track down an endangered plant, you're trying to locate its habitat, or you're trying to uh, monitor invasive species coming in. Um, our, our focus is definitely getting the uh, technology out into um, organizations that can that can really benefit from it. And uh, not to go too far off topic, but one of one of our key pushes here is definitely education, uh, STEM education. And it's 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 a lot easier to get kids excited about STEM uh, when they when they're playing around with the UAV than to um, you know have them you know looking at something that's uh, very abstract. And so. Uh, it, you can get them excited and engaged uh, immediately, and so we're trying to get uh, the high school and middle schools involved with robotics competitions, um, getting involved with the programming of UAVs, uh, building them, um, and flying them. Um, and I would say uh, one of my personal uh, interests is, is definitely the exciting part is uh, using UAVs for very remote uh, monitoring applications. Um, so I, I co-founded a company called DroneFlow, and we are basically uh, developing autonomous UAVs um, so that you could station them out in uh, remote areas to monitor um, something that you wouldn't have humans uh, get to very easily um, or you could just have someone control a system with just a tablet and you wouldn't need to have uh, you know RC controller or anything like that and so using computer vision for 3D navigation um, I think is one of the really exciting applications that are coming up for UAVs, whether it's for disaster relief, going inside buildings, or just modern infrastructure like a bridge or uh, a wind farm or something like that. Great. Well, that's about all the time we have today. Uh, we thank you for joining us here on Think Tech Hawaii, Where the Road Leads. I want to thank my three guests here that we have with us here, Jennifer Davidson of the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center, Chuck Devaney here from UH Manoa, and, and Nick Turner there in Hilo, UH Hilo, on the Big Island, joining us via Skype. Thank you all for all being with us, and Ted Rawson should be back with us next week. Thanks again. <laughs>